talking a lot about sex linked traits and how typically females tend to have two X chromosomes and males tend to have one X and one Y chromosome. But it's important for us to acknowledge a genotypical condition known as intersex. Now, historically, intersex has been conflated with a few other terms. So just to clear the air on this, it's important to acknowledge that intersex in humans is not the same as being a hermaphrodite in non-human species. The term hermaphrodite refers to an organism that has both female and male gonads and may have the possibility to reproduce with itself. There's no such thing as humans who are hermaphrodites. And I want to be very clear on this. If a human were to be hermaphrodite, that would need to be a person who has both ovaries and testes. And despite what pop culture may tell you, there's been no medical documented cases of any human having both ovaries and testes. And therefore hermaphrodite would be a scientifically incorrect term to use for humans. Intersex refers to someone who does not physiologically fall in the categories of being female or male entirely. And this can be a very blurry definition. Now, adding to this complexity is the fact there's over 13 different possible etiologies or causes to an intersex condition. And some of these causes may be genetic, prenatal, or postnatal. We're only going to talk really about the genetic and the prenatal etiologies for this course. But because of this, there's many different definitions of intersex. Historically, some definitions were too broad. For instance, some definitions of intersex included everybody who was outside the gender binary, whether it was physical or psychological. That may include people who would prefer to use labels such as non-binary, genderqueer, gender fluid, or transgender. Some definitions are also found to be too narrow historically. And these are definitions that were exclusively narrowed in on the genitalia and talking about whether the genitalia could be classified as a penis and scrotum or as a vulva leading to a vagina. And that anything outside those two areas would be intersex and only that. So historically, this has been called ambiguous genitalia, though there have been some controversies around the use of that term. So rather than using the really broad definition, which made intersex be equivalent to non-binary and resulted in one in 500 births being intersex, or the really narrow definition focusing just on genitalia, leading to intersex having a prevalence of one in 2000, today we tend to find most researchers try to find middle ground. And that is, they try to find physical causes of physiological intersex that may not be exclusively focused on the genitalia. And so just the physical but not the psychological causes tends to have a prevalence rate of about 1 in 1500. And it's important to note that many intersex people may also identify as transgender, genderqueer, gender fluid, or non-binary, but there could be a lot more complexities to it, of course. And so how could there be a physiological difference that's not completely encapsulated by genitalia? Well, to help understand that, we're going to talk about some examples. We're talking about some genetic causes as well as some prenatal causes. When we talk about genetic causes of intersex, we're really talking about chromosomal atypicalities. And this tends to be chromosomal atypicalities that are centered on the sex chromosomes. This is controversial because there are individuals with these atypicalities that do not identify as intersex. And that is because these can appear on a spectrum. So some people with these conditions have very different gender identities and very different ways they view themselves. But two possible examples are Turner syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome. So in Turner syndrome, what happens here is chromosomally an individual only has one sex chromosome. They don't have XX or XY. Instead, they have one X chromosome. And so the prevalence rate of Turner syndrome tends to happen at about one in every 2,500 births that are assigned female. Now what happens here is because there's only one X chromosome, there are some phenotypical expressions associated with this condition. People with Turner syndrome tend to be a bit shorter in stature. They tend to have a bit of a wider neck and a bit of a broader chest. More importantly, at the time of puberty, their experience with puberty is very different from females with two X chromosomes. 
That is, they tend to experience an underdevelopment of their secondary sex characteristics. In particular, their breast development tends to be different where they develop smaller breasts that are not as rounded as other types. They may not start to menstruate and they may never ovulate. So many individuals with Turner syndrome are not able to conceive and have children. Now, many people with Turner syndrome do identify as females and as women, but some individuals with Turner syndrome prefer to identify as intersex. And it's really up to the individual experience. And not all individuals with Turner syndrome will experience the same phenotypical things to the same degree. Another example of chromosomal intersex is Klinefelter syndrome. Now, this is when an individual has an extra sex chromosome. Rather than missing one, they tend to have two X's as well as a Y. Chromosome. So with these three here, we see that they have the X and the Y enough for them to develop many male characteristics, but they also have two X's, which are typically associated with female characteristics. Babies with Klinefelter syndrome tend to be most often assigned male at birth, and this happens at a prevalence rate of about one in a thousand. Now what happens here is individuals with Klinefelters can develop on a large variety of a spectrum. There's much heterogeneity in these individuals. Some individuals with Klinefelters, uh, they tend to develop as typically developed males. They tend to be assigned male at birth, their external genitalia looks to what you would expect from a male, and they may go on to have a masculine gender identity, but they may have a slightly lower sperm count. Or maybe they have completely no sperm and they're completely infertile. Some of these males also might experience some breast development. They may have less body hair than was typical in males, and they might have slightly higher percentage of body fat than what's typical in males. At the other end of the spectrum, some people with chromosomal Klinefelters may also be assigned female at birth, or may go on to have a feminine gender identity. They may be individuals who have very substantial breast development, almost no body hair, and a very high degree of body fat, very similar to what's typical in females. We also may have some individuals who are neither ends of those spectrums. They may experience a variety of conditions where their external genitalia might look in a myriad of possible ways that would not be classified as either a penis or a vulva. Some of these could be including an enlarged clitoris or a micro penis or an incomplete vulval opening or a somewhat of a descended scrotum. There could be many different combinations in there. They also might be a person who goes on to have more of a gender queer identity. They're non-binary and they don't see themselves on either end of the spectrums. And so they may be more likely to have an intersex identity. But it's important to understand some people with client filters identify as males, some people identify as intersex, and some people identify as females. Now, aside from those two chromosomal conditions, we also want to talk about some prenatal and hormonal conditions associated with intersex. And most of these tend to be around the absorption and the release of androgens, specifically with testosterone in mind. The most common cause of intersex with individuals who are chromosomally XX is a condition known as congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So in individuals with two X chromosomes who also have another allele in their genome that codes for congenital adrenal hyperplasia, this happens about one in every 10,000 people who are born with XX chromosomes. What happens here is their adrenal glands just above their kidneys produce an extra large amount of androgens and their body absorbs the androgens more readily. Now what happens is people with CIH, they tend to develop again on a spectrum. Some individuals with CIH are born and assigned female at birth and go on to identify as women, but perhaps just more tomboyish or more butch. Many of them may actually identify as butch lesbians and they just tend to have a bit more muscle structure. Maybe they tend to be more affiliate with more masculine type behavior, but they definitely identify as women. Some of them on the complete other end of the spectrum may be born and fully identify as men. And that's because although chromosomally they are XX, the absorption of testosterone in their body prenatally changed the outcome of their physiological and psychological development. There could also be individuals that are not neither end of those spectrums who identify somewhere in the middle and have an intersex identity. On the flip side of this, we also have a condition in individuals who are chromosomally XY, which is known as androgen insensitivity syndrome. And androgen insensitivity syndrome happens on a prevalence of about one in every 20,000 births. 
And this is a condition where the body is unable to either partially or completely absorb and use androgens. And so what happens here is although their body produces androgens, they're not able to absorb it. And in partial cases like this, we may see a person who's assigned male at birth who just has low sperm count or is very effeminate, or we might have a person who identifies as intersex and has um, external genitalia that could not be classified, or they may, in some cases of complete androgen insensitivity, their body's not able to absorb any androgens. These individuals are born with extremely feminine features. So they have an extremely feminized jawline, they have very little body hair whatsoever, they have long eyelashes, they have a very feminine physique. And so what happens here with individuals with that type of complete androgen insensitivity syndrome is they're born assigned female at birth, they tend to have uh, a gender identity where they identify as women, but what often happens is they have internalized testes that can't ovulate and they can't menstruate. And often these individuals don't even recognize this about themselves until they're in adolescence and when they're trying to identify perhaps why their menstruation never started. So again, with both of these conditions, individuals with the same condition can manifest in a variety of ways. And so intersex is a really heterogeneous phenomena which occurs at a very small frequency but has lots of diversity within it.